Yeah, hi everybody. I see that uh, some people are logging on, so I'll give everyone a few minutes and then I'm gonna uh, introduce myself. Hopefully you're all doing well. I can't see any of you yet, but a few of you have signed on. All right, so maybe I'll tell some of you guys a little bit about me. I have been working with talk about her. for about eight years. And <clears throat> I've worked as an expedition guide, as an expedition leader. I've helped in our office a little bit. And I've been working in Alaska for probably the past six summers. And then in, I've worked in Hawaii and Costa Rica, Panama. I've, I've had the opportunity to be in almost all the uncruised sailing. So it's been a very fun adventure for me with uncruised expeditions. And uh, currently, I live on San Juan Island. This has been my home base off and on for the past 15 years or so. And this is where I really fell in love with being in the natural world, guiding, connecting with people, connecting to nature. And the reason I chose to present on orcas today is because, well, obviously they're a beautiful, charismatic animal, but also because working as a guide out here, I came out here when I was about, 22 and started working as a kayak guide and had the opportunity to kayak amongst the southern resident killer whales here and it was just a incredible opportunity to be on the water connect with people and get to experience these magnificent animals that are just uh hang on i'm working on it also just a little side note on uh orcas in this presentation is that I like to consider myself a orca enthusiast. I have been working in different regions of the world from Alaska to Antarctica to the Salish Sea with orcas, but I am not a research biologist where my main focus is orcas. And I actually live in a community where that is a big thing here. There's a center for whale research where a lot of information about orcas is generated. So I like to consider this kind of a general exciting introduction to orcas and different information about them. And at the end of the presentation, I'll have a list of resources if you're really interested in reading more about current research that's happening, you can look at, at the resources at the end. Great. So I guess we'll get started. You guys are ready. And maybe I'll ask you uh, if you haven't muted your uh, computers to mute them, just so that if you're talking in the background, since I can't see you, I don't get uh, sidetracked. Here we go. So, Orcinus orcas, that's the Latin name for orcas, spirit of the sea. I like to label this presentation spirit of the sea because Orcinus comes from the Latin term of uh, like kind of connected to spirits of the ocean and killer whales have a long history with different Native American groups throughout the Pacific Northwest where in different tribes actually believe that when they die they get reincarnated, reincarnated back as a orca. So that's why I like to title this presentation. Let me see if I can uh, continue sharing. There we go. All right, so just a little bit of basics on the two different kinds of whales. If you sail with us in, with on cruise, I'm sure you've seen whales. I'm sure you've had amazing naturalists that have taught you about some of the differences, but just the main basics is that we have the tooth whales and the uh, odontocetes, uh, the tooth whales and the baleen whales. So here's a little uh, diagram. I'm sure many of you who cruise with us in Alaska have seen the humpback whales. That's a probably one of the most common mysticetes or baleen whales that you might see. And then we've got our most famous charismatic tooth whale which is the orca. And that's about as technical as we're going to get on the breakdown of all the whales. But I'm just going to give you a little information. This is a nice diagram that shows you all of the whales on planet Earth. So up on the top half, you have all the mysticetes. Those are all baleen whales. Baleen whales are usually much larger. They typically have two blowholes that they breathe out of. That makes that huge plume. And tooth whales are generally a little bit smaller, sperm whale being one of the largest tooth whales. And that, then there are many different types of tooth whales, odontocetes, 
that have porpoises and dolphins and, uh, and other odontocetes in that category. So a little bit on the basics of the structure of the bodies of these two kinds of whales. If you look at the top whale of the mysticete, they've got that mustache, which is their baleen. They have this jaw that it has these ventricle pleats that expand. They're the ones that take big giant gulps of water and then use their tongue to push the water out as they trap in plankton and fish. If it's a humpback, they'll have those large pectoral fins on the side. But in general, if you look at that diagram, you can see that most of those baleen whales are gonna have really small dorsal fins. So if you see a dorsal fin coming up out of the water, it's most usually gonna be some kind of uh, porpoise or dolphin. And uh, if it's a humpback, you'll get a nice tiny little fin there. And then below we've got our odontocetes and some of the common features of odontocetes is that they're going to have dorsal fins uh, varying in size depending on what kind of animal they are. Belugas are probably and sperm whales are two of the odontocetes that don't have dorsal fins. And then they have a more round rostrum which is the shape of their head. I also mentioned earlier that a main difference in their blowhole or the way that they breathe is that the mysticete baleen whale will have a double blowhole at the top of their head, and then the odontocetes have a singular hole from which they breathe. So that picture that I showed you that had all of the whales in it, there's about 70 animals uh, of whales from the tooth to the baleen. And of those 70, 34 are dolphins and six are porpoises around the world. Uh, dolphins and porpoises get confused a lot of the time because they look really similar. Uh, flipper is a pretty classic dolphin and oftentimes uh, when we're out at sea you might see uh, another animal that looks like a uh, dolphin because it has that kind of flipper look but it might actually be a porpoise. So some of the main differences if, you look, if you're looking inside the mouth, which can be a bit hard to do obviously if we're looking at them from up above, uh, but one of the main differences when we find their bodies uh, washed up on shore is the shape of their teeth. So uh, dolphins are going to have a more conical tooth, uh, that's the one on the right, and the porpoises are going to have a more spade-shaped tooth on the left there. They also have a few other distinguishing factors. The beak, which is the rostrum, if you think of Flipper, he was a bottlenose dolphin and that had that really distinguishing beak. That's, that's a good common factor that we'll see in dolphins. In porpoises, for those of you that have sailed with us in Alaska, perhaps you've seen a doll's porpoise. They look like little baby black and white orcas, but they're actually a porpoise. And they have a much rounder, more blunt shaped uh, rostrum. And uh, in general, the porpoises' spaces are going to be a bit more rounded out. Their size uh, is another distinguishing factor where the dolphins are going to be a bit larger. Porpoises are usually going to range between three to five feet, and dolphins can be four to, you know, 25 feet long, depending on what kind of animal they are. We talked about the size of their melon, that's the head and the, uh, the rostrum, and then the dorsal fin shape itself and size can also vary. So for a dolphin, sometimes dolphins might look like sharks in the water. If you're off the, if you're on the coast of LA or Santa Barbara, you might see big dorsal fins rising out of the water, and oftentimes those are going to be dolphin species. They have uh, dorsal fins that can be about a foot and a half to three feet off the water, where the porpoises are going to be much smaller dorsal fins, about a foot or less, and uh, usually they almost look like little birds when they're swimming in the water, the porpoises, because their dorsal fin is so small uh, as they're swimming. And then uh, the behaviors right now of dolphins are much more studied, so they're finding that there's a lot more uh, communal networking between dolphins and different dolphin species and that porpoise is uh, a little less known on, on those same kind of behaviors of how they work together as a family unit. Uh, orcas are amazing because they are whales and dolphins. They are the largest dolphin in the dolphin family. And sometimes because of the name killer whale, people are confused that they are just a whale and they're not a dolphin but they actually are a dolphin. They're just a very, very large one. And that's one of the reasons that they are so intelligent and at work in these communal ways. So we're gonna get into orcas. Just gonna adjust my screen here for a second. 
here we go. So if you've seen orcas in the wild, usually we're seeing their dorsal fin coming up out of the water. And one of the things that's so incredible I found when I was working as a kayak guide uh, off the coast of San Juan Island years ago is that when I was sitting on the water kayaking and I had these orcas approaching our group, the male dorsal fin rises up and out of the water about three meters or six feet. And when you're sitting on the water, that can feel really large. So uh, they have these huge dorsal fins. It works as a keel for them as they're swimming in the water. Uh, if you're looking at the screen I have up on there, their size, their average size for male is about 20 to 26 feet. And a female is going to be a little bit smaller, uh, about 18 to 22 feet. But the largest male on record was about 32 feet long, which is pretty big and 20,000 feet. So these animals get quite large. In general, if you see a pod of orcas and you see uh, the different size fins, you're going to be able to tell a male from a female um, from just the general size. That male dorsal fin is so large and tall coming up out of the water. And the female dorsal fin is about three feet tall, uh, a little bit more curved. The confusing thing happens is that young juvenile males before they reach that age in puberty where they sprout their dorsal fin can actually have uh, shorter dorsal fins like a female. So that male dorsal fin when they're about 15 years old will start to sprout and grow tall into that really tall large fin. So you can't always completely know the sex of the orcas unless you're like some of the researchers and naturalists that live out actually here on San Juan Island. Many of them can identify the orcas by the shape of the saddle patch behind their dorsal fin and the different markings of their eye patch. And that's one of the ways that scientists have been studying orcas and uh, have been able to identify them and name them and track some of their social behaviors and ages for the past 35, 40 years is that each dorsal fin is unique amongst all uh, marine mammals actually each dorsal fin is going to be unique and on orcas if you look at this picture there's a little white patch behind the dorsal fin that's labeled the saddle patch and each saddle patch is going to be unique as well so they can take a picture of that dorsal fin and saddle patch and use that to identify the animal and then they can also use other distinguishing factors like the size of the eye patch or any kind of marks or scrapes on the animal. So this is a little bit different uh, if you have cruised with us or if you've been out on the water and seen humpbacks. They usually identify those whales or different baleen and mysticete whales by their flukes, their tails, and any marks or scrapes on the tail. So for odontocetes, it's almost always their dorsal fin saddle patch and then the other unique markings. Oh gosh, so sorry, didn't mean to skip over that picture. So uh, this is actually a picture of one of my favorite orcas that I got to know when I started to work as a kayak guide out here. I was never a naturalist that fully could name all the different orcas because, I don't know, I guess I'm just not, not that good yet. But uh, this orca was uh, J1 or Ruffles and he had this tall, six foot tall dorsal fin that would rise up out of the water and uh, it had a little bit of a curve to the end of it. And when he came around, uh, you knew who he was. And in the San Juan Islands and Salish Sea area, he was a pretty well-known orca. He lived to be about uh, 62 years old. And he actually swam with the whale that was believed to be his mother, J2, also known as Granny, who was believed to be about 100, 204 when she died and she was swimming with five generations of her family. So we're going to get into a little bit of the family dynamics of orcas. Orcas are a matriarchal pod society so when a baby orca is born it will stay with its mother for its whole life and the way that these guys mate is that different family groups will come together and they try to mate across the matrilines. So they're very family oriented. A lot of the research about orcas actually comes from this area where I live right now. The southern residents that live here in the Salish Sea, they are some of the easier orca pods to do research on because they live in a small enough area, or they have over the past few decades, where people have been able to do different studies on them. I mean, we've been able to find some really cool uh, factors of the family dynamics of food sharing and the ways that uh, 
mothers will take care of their family and, and how grandmothers actually play a really big role. So I'm gonna get into that in a few more slides down the way, but we can talk a little bit just about the pod structure of the residents and offshore orcas. I'm also gonna mention transients and it, some of the research that's coming out about transients doesn't necessarily fit into this uh, schemata here. But in general, across all ecotypes of orcas on planet Earth, they're all match lines where the uh, females, mothers are uh, swimming and the brothers and sisters are swimming together with them. And the breeding is almost always across match line and not within the same family pod group. And that just helps to create healthy uh, survival for the offspring. Many people are aware of some of the fun ways that orcas uh, are very playful. You know, they're the largest dolphin in the dolphin family. So these guys, are they like to jump, they like to breach, they're very animated. You'll see them uh, flipping their, their tails. And uh, I always like to think that they're very situationally aware. In this picture, uh, behind the tail of this orca is a lighthouse. And here in San Juan Island, there's a park called Lime Kiln State Park. And many people refer to it as Whale Watch Park. And it's a place that hundreds of people will come daily in the summer to try to see these uh, southern resident orcas as they would swim by and uh, they'd usually be hunting for fish. And I actually had a, a few experiences where I was sitting maybe like a quarter mile south of this park with this lighthouse where tons of people come and congregate on the lighthouse. And I actually watched these orcas where they were swimming along. I was sitting on just like a cliff side farther down and they were being totally normal. But as they got close to this park where people always congregate, they started to literally put on a show where they were jumping and breaching and slapping their tails. And I think a lot of their animation is for their own pleasure. But uh, I think they also here at the Lime Kiln State Park would sometimes be uh, a little animated for some of the people out there. They love to breach and jump out of the water. So this is a little baby breaching. And uh, you know, no one really knows why whales in general breach. There's lots of theories that maybe they're like, sloughing off some dead skin, or maybe they're communicating, but uh, oftentimes, you know, many of us that are enthusiasts for whales think it could just be because it's fun and it feels good. Orcas are also really curious animals. They uh, are very situationally aware. They have a very large brain. They're echolocating. They're using underwater sonar to see and feel out their environment. So they know what's going on on a totally different level that we as humans can even conceptualize. And uh, when they're curious and they wanna see what's going on, they actually will stick their head up out of the water and they do what's called spy hopping, where they look around and they see what's going on. So if you look at this picture, you can actually see the little orca eyeball just right underneath that white eye patch. And if you've sailed with me before, <laughs> because I do believe that orcas are paying attention, you might have heard me woohooing for the orcas or for other uh, odontocy whales that we see and I've actually had the experience where I'm out there on the water and I'll be uh, woohoo shouting getting all excited and sometimes the orcas will actually pop up because they can hear us uh, above the water um, but they will do that all the time and uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of some of the ecotypes that live down in Antarctica that will often spy hop as they're checking out some of their prey uh, which are seals which they might be hunting on ice packs. Uh, orcas are the top apex predator of the ocean. They are the kings of the sea. Uh, they actually eat white sharks if they want to. And I have a little video and picture I'll show you of that. So these guys are at the very top and there are different ecotypes uh, across planet Earth that are eating different things. And unfortunately, life at the top has its, to um, has its pros and cons, right? They don't have anybody else trying to eat them. But because they're at the top, there is an issue of bioaccumulation of toxins in these animals because they are often eating all the things that are eating other things and other things. And uh, by the time it gets into the orcas, they have a very large load of toxins in their bodies and they don't have an easy way to get rid of it. And that has really been impacting orcas across the world and their ability to reproduce successfully, especially uh, as in modern times of the past half century and century, just all the different, <clears throat> excuse me, all the different uh, 
pollutants and contaminants that are in the water that are getting absorbed through the food chain, it's really been impacting orcas. And that's one of the reasons I love to talk about orcas and do different types of presentations. Uh, sometimes I talk about uh, marine plastic pollution and I'll connect it with orcas, but orcas are a great canary in the coal mine for just the dynamics of what's happening in the ocean right now. Uh, they're beautiful and sleek from the top, but when you really look at uh, what's happening to their ability to uh, reproduce and their family structure, they're really struggling uh, as a, a species in different ecotypes around the world because they have about a 50% survival chance for their babies, if they're lucky, of those babies surviving because of all the toxins that the mother will accumulate and then it uh, gets off put into the babies. And then the milk itself uh, can be a little toxic, especially for first birth for a female. So they are the kings of the sea at the top of the food chain, but uh, that comes with its complications these days. Uh, this chart always makes me smile a little bit because uh, the pink is everywhere on planet Earth where you can find killer whales, which is basically, uh, everywhere uh, in the world, except for like on the land and in the ice itself, that's completely solid. So um, yeah, the, they say there's about 50,000 killer whales across planet Earth, and I've seen them in uh, Alaska. I've seen them obviously here in the Pacific Northwest. They've been seen in Hawaii. I've been around when some of the offshore orchids have come into Hawaii. And I actually saw one when I was on a cruise with Uncruise in Panama. For those of you guys that have been to Isla Coiba, we saw orcas come in there one day, which was a totally... Uh, just lucky sighting for us. So they can be found all over the world. And this is the most up-to-date breakdown of the different uh, killer whale orca ecotypes. So as of right now, they're all considered one species, which is Orchinus orca, but they're finding that depending on where they live, just like humans, we're all the same species, but depending on where we live, we have different cultures, we eat different food, we have different types of habits and ways that we interact as uh, groups. So that's how it works with uh, killer whales. And the whales on the right hand side are the northern hemisphere whales. And the top whale is the residential killer whale. And the majority of the data that's in this presentation that I am familiar with has come from the research from the southern whales the southern resident killer whales that live here in the Salish Sea. So they have been the most easily accessible group, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, to study. And then below them is the Biggs killer whale, uh, also known as transient. Um, Biggs killer whale are the other type of main orca that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And transients uh, in general eat a variety of marine mammals, and then below that is uh, offshore killer whales. So I'm going to be talking about those three kinds of whales, but if you look at the rest of this picture, there are more ecotypes than that. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work down in Antarctica, and so the top four on the left-hand side are the killer whales that live in the southern hemisphere in Antarctica. And we can talk a little bit about those guys. And then I really don't know much at all about the uh, North Atlantic killer whales. And those are the ones uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the right hand of the screen. So there's still a lot of research happening. There's still a lot of things being learned. And that's what I love about science and also about killer whales because they're the most highly studied whale right now in the world. And especially these Southern residents that live here are actually the most highly studied group of whales in the world. Yet we're still just scratching the surface as we start to learn different things and create more studies. So I put this slide in here for those of you that have sailed with us uh, in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, just to get a feel for some of the orcas that maybe you've seen and the different groups that uh, live in this region, the Pacific Northwest. The, the bright pink coloring uh, there in Washington and British Columbia, those are the southern residents. And if you look at how close their ranges to habited areas like Victoria, Seattle, uh, Vancouver, you'll understand why those whales are more easy to study. And then as we move up, a lot of those other areas are just less populated and larger and therefore harder to get research vessels out uh, on the water and land sightings. But uh, the pink uh, peach color is the British Columbian pods, also known as the northern residents. And the southern and the northern residents are very similar in their pod structure and the food that they eat. 
And then if you've sailed up in Alaska with us, we've got that blue coloring there through Southeast Alaska, and those are the Southeastern Alaskan pods. And that includes resident pods that are fish eaters and transient pods that are mammal eaters. And then we've got this yellow group up on the far left side, and that's the Prince William Sound pods. And those are probably the second most studied group of whales. Though, to be honest, I haven't really read many papers about those whales, but in general, they've had like a, a bit more documentation on those groups up there in Prince William Sound and down in the pink area of the Salish Sea. And I, I keep saying this word, if you're not familiar with it, Salish Sea is a, a title that was created in 2011 that includes the water of British Columbia and Washington. So if you look at that bright pink area, you can see that it's pretty hard to draw a line for the animals across where the ecosystem starts and ends. So instead of calling it Puget Sound and Inland Seas or some of the different ways, Georgia Straits, we now just call the whole thing the Salish Sea. All right, so orca dynamics. These guys are family oriented. They live in communities, in family pod groups, and sometimes you'll even get super pods. That was one of the things that really got me excited when I started uh, living and working as a kayak guide out here, is that I actually, I think it was maybe my second or third kayak trip. I'm back. So uh, I was just telling you guys a little, a little story about the super pods and that uh, when I started working out here in the San Juan Islands as a kayak guide, I was kayaking along and then I heard this blow of a whale and I turned around and this pod of orcas started swimming by us. And what happens or was happening here, it's not really anymore. Uh, in the summertime, these family groups of orcas would get together and you would get what they call a super pod, which at the time when I was working out here, was about 90 individuals and so all of a sudden I had these orcas swimming under our kayaks and then they were breaching all over and it's these super pods and the mixing of these family groups that is how uh, some of these larger mostly residential orca pods will mate with each other and it's kind of like family gatherings they get together they're rolling around they're very playful and you can get that in different regions of the world but it's just you have to really be in the right place and time to capture it and, and, and see it and uh, for a long time it was possible to see out here in the pacific northwest not impossible anymore but a little bit harder these days because the salmon are uh, most often on the western side of vancouver island but here in the uh, eastern uh, north pacific we have about uh, 2,500 killer whales. So that's pretty good. And that's all those populations that I talked about from Washington, British Columbia, Alaska, and Prince William Sound. So yeah, these guys, uh, the resident orcas, very family oriented, swimming together. And now I'm gonna break it down for you and talk a little bit about some of the differences between the residents, the transients and offshore orcas, because uh, this is where I think it gets really kind of interesting. They all look the same from the outside. This is actually ruffles again. There's that uh, really nice uh, jagged dorsal fin of his. So if you are like some of the naturalists out here, not myself, I'm not quite this good, but you can actually go whale watching out here in the San Juan Islands and be with naturalists that can name and identify every orca that they see. And they will uh, see an orca, uh, all the orcas here in the Salish Sea area, uh, both Biggs whales and the uh, resident whales have a name and a number with a letter that identifies them. So uh, the way that these naturalists identify them is that they'll see that dorsal fin, its unique shape, and they'll notice the, the, the saddle patch behind them. A general way to look at it, although myself having spent a lot of time in waters with orcas, still find this tricky. I've been up there in Glacier Bay in different parts of Alaska and me and the other guide team are, are trying to decide if it's residents and or transients based on the dorsal fin. And, and it can be tricky. Um, usually the best way to tell what kind of orca is is if it's feeding and that's really going to be your best giveaway. But a, a generalization of how to figure it out is that residents are going to have a little bit more of a curved dorsal fin and transients are gonna have more of a straight up and down, almost like witch's hat style dorsal fin. Although animals in the wild, often some variation. They say like this picture here shows you that the resident 
uh, has a more open saddle and that the transient might have a larger saddle patch that's more uniformly gray. Uh, I'm not really mentioning the offshores that much because they are so hard to see. Uh, if you saw an offshore, it would be like way offshore and that would probably be your best uh, signal that it's an offshore. Uh, like in Hawaii, for example, when orcas are seen out there, they're most definitely offshore orcas because those are the only orcas that are hanging out in the middle of the Pacific. So uh, one of the cool research projects that's happened out here in the Salish Sea area is that they actually, um, over a decade, probably almost 20 years ago, they dropped these hydrophones along the west side of the island, close to that lighthouse that I showed you a picture of uh, earlier on. And on these hydrophones, they were able to record the orcas as they're swimming by. And they found with these three different family groups that, uh, well, in general, orcas are gonna be echolocating. So they're gonna be making some clicks and whistles that are gonna bounce off the surrounding environment. And uh, if they're fish eaters, it actually helps them to see the fish that are around them and uh, sometimes even herd the fish towards the rocky shoreline. Well, they'll then use that as a natural netting system and, and snatch up the fish and then share it with each other. But they've also found that with the Southern residents that live down here, the three family pods, the J, K, and L pod, that they actually have a different dialect between each pod. So they noticed the uh, different whistle and clicks and songs and that each different family group, they were speaking the same basic orca language, but you could distinguish who is who uh, based on the sound of their calls. And they also found that the other type of orca in this area, the transient orcas, spoke an almost completely different orca language to the resident orca language. Now, if you and I were listening to these sounds, it all sounds like orca squeaks, but uh, to the trained professional, you can actually tell them apart. So that's pretty cool, some of the research that's happened down here. Because of the lack of salmon in the Salish Sea, we've seen a bit of a migration of these residential orca pods. The ones, the southern residents that have been most highly researched have actually had to spend more time out off the coast of uh, Vancouver Island to find their salmon. And because of that, the other type of orca that also lives in this area has been having a big heyday for all of the uh, marine mammals that live in this area. There's a lot of uh, harbor porpoise, sorry, not harbor porpoises. There are a lot of harbor porpoises, actually, but there's a lot of harbor seals out here, uh, very large population, as well as sea lions, and the transients have uh, been making such a presence here in the Salish Sea that they're just referring to them as bigs whales uh, here in this area where I'm living right now. So if you guys come on a cruise with us out here, you're most likely these days to see bigs whales in the San Juan Island, Salish Sea area, as well uh, as if you're going up the, uh, the Inside Passage, although you might see some northern residents. But the transients, which the bigs are a type of, are uh, they have a different pod structure to the resident whale. So residents are almost always going to be eating uh, fish or at least like the same type of food. They live a little bit closer to shore. They're not as worried about scaring their prey. Transients are going to be uh, mammal eaters from sea lions to seals to uh, porpoises to sometimes even baby whales and they are going to travel in much smaller groups and they're going to be much more stealthy and quiet and so they don't like to be in these big family groups singing and playing and rolling with each other because they don't want all of their prey to know that they're coming so they're going to be in smaller groups they're going to switch where they're hunting so that their prey is not used to them and you can actually find this type of killer whale all across the planet from the americas to the arctic to the antarctic they're the most abundant type of killer whale. And um, they don't have a lot of uh, great studies on them yet to know all the dynamics of their families because they move around so much that they're actually pretty hard to, to see. But not see, but to see and understand all the social dynamics. Uh, one of the interesting things living here in the San Juan Islands, especially moving back here, I just moved back to land after five years at sea, is that the bigs are spending so much time here that they're starting to have more access as researchers to understand more of the dynamics of these uh, transient killer whales. And even though they're a stealthier killer whale that doesn't want to alert its prey that they're around, I just saw some the other day off the shore and they were just 
screeching and tail slapping. And I actually thought that they were resident orcas, but I called up a friend of mine that was on the water uh, collecting research data, which I'll tell you about at the end. And uh, they said that they were the bigs. So um, we're still learning a lot. But in general, there are acoustic differences. There are pod structure differences. You're not going to have these giant family groups and super pods of transients swimming all together at once. You'll usually have smaller groups. And, that, and then sometimes you will see some of those smaller groups hanging out. Uh, acoustically, they're different. And here in the Salish Sea, we used to call it the, uh, you know, the West Side Story of orcas because you would have the resident killer whales that were over here on the U.S. San Juan side. And then on just eight miles across the water on the Canadian side, you might have the transients. But the two, they never mixed. They never intermingled or mated. Um, and, and they actually actively avoid the fish eating residents which you know you might think that oh they're a mammal eater they could eat a baby resident why would they not just come in but they they actively avoid each other <clears throat> so these are some pictures that i was able to take when i was working down in antarctica of uh, three different ecotypes of killer whales and i put an interesting animation on this it's it's new for me and for you uh, but uh the one in the middle uh and the one on the top they if you take a look at those pictures look at how different their eye patches are so in antarctica there are four different ecotypes of orcas type a b c and d and over the past 15 years more and more research has been happening because uh, especially the Antarctic Peninsula has just become more accessible. There are more types of research tools available like drones and, uh, and different types of boats and setups to do research to find out more about these orcas. But um, the A, B, and C <clears throat> are actually all uh, marine mammal eating orcas. And then the type D that has that little teeny tiny eye patch very rarely seen. The, the fact that I, I was able to see them while I was down there was kind of incredible because, I mean, if you see them once every couple of years working down there, you're lucky. They're, you got to be in the right place at the right time. And they have the teeniest uh, eye patch. I mean, look, let's look back. If you look at these ones up here, they're so small, that little eye patch. They think it might perhaps correlate to the food that they eat, which is maybe small herring. And I put this picture in here because whenever we're talking about orcas, people really like to talk about the orcas that create, they work as a pack of wolves almost to create a wave to wash seals off of the pack ice. And that is uh, the type B orcas. So you'll see these guys and they'll kind of do their communicating underwater. They'll pop up and they're actually, most orcas are pretty picky eaters. So they don't want to eat just any seal that's on the ice. They want to make sure it's the seal that they're into. So they'll pop up and if it's what they want to eat, then they'll get together as a group. And sometimes they will uh, come together and they'll actually create a wave swimming as a group. And that wave can actually wash the seal off the ice. And uh, I'm not amazing with technology, so I wasn't able to upload a lot of videos into this presentation. But if you're interested in seeing videos, I mean, you can just Google, you know, pack ice orcas, and you can see all kinds of amazing captures of uh, orcas working together to, uh, to catch their prey. And then one of the things that they find about orcas uh, around the world that ties back to this family orientation is that they are very family oriented and they share their food. Uh, so they work together and then they share. So that's pretty cool. The offshore community is fascinating to me. Um, very little known about these offshore orcas because they're living out there in the middle of the ocean. And unless you're out there in the middle of the ocean, you're really not going to be able to encounter them. And, uh, you know, these days it's pretty expensive to get funding for research just to pay for the gas to go out different places. So there's not a ton of funding for boats that are just out there in the middle of the oceans looking for some of these orca pods. They weren't even really discovered or uh, known to be anything you know, special really until the 1980s. And there's different research happening. Uh, Cascadia Research is an organization based out of Olympia that's doing some really cool research. Uh, but, and also NOAA has some research that I was able to read on about uh, the different numbers, but obviously it's hard to get a full grasp of a 
species of animal that lives across the planet in the middle of the, the deep blue ocean. But they've seen them uh, off the coast of South Africa. They've seen them off the coast of uh, Southern California. I'm not totally sure if those are the same pods or different pods. But one thing they found is that um, offshore orcas actually really enjoy eating sharks. So back to that top of the food chain thing, these guys off the coast of Africa are eating great whites and uh, across other parts of the ocean they're eating different types of sharks. Uh, something that I found really interesting and I got this information from the Center for Whale Research, the fourth bullet point down here, is that they did find some genetic similarity from the offshore orcas that are in the middle of the ocean eating sharks to the southern residents which are these family pods that have been coming back to this area every year eating fish, they found more similarity between them than the residents and the transients that are living in the same body of water right here where I live uh, genetically are very different. So some interesting science. There's still, you know, if you want to get your PhD uh, related to orcas, there's all kinds of cool projects you can get into. <clears throat> this is actually from a video right here. If you're interested, like I was saying, you can go uh, online, you can, you can type in uh, orca eating great white. If you look at that picture, you can see uh, that shark there, and that's actually a great white shark. And uh, National Geographic has a video of this on, on their website. And so you can go and check it out. And what these guys do, they take the sharks, they flip them on their back, and they put them into the state of tonic immobility where it's like the shark is sleeping. That's how a lot of research on sharks is done is they flip them over on their back. And then they come in and what's incredible and you'll, you'll hear in this video if you watch it at some point is they actually like almost precision surgical like as best as you can with a set of orca teeth. They eat just the liver of the shark. And I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to feel shark skin, but shark skin is very, very thick, tough sandpaper-like skin. It actually wears down on the teeth. And uh, they found uh, old, older orcas that have washed up on shore with their teeth worn all the way down, which they are presuming are these offshore orcas. And they actually think that the younger orcas, so similar to some of the other pod dynamics, which I'll tell, talk to you about where the grandmothers and mothers play a huge role uh, in the hunting, these offshore orcas, the younger orcas are doing a little bit more of the work and they're helping in sharing that food with the older orcas because the older orcas are gonna have these more worn down teeth. And then uh, this is another, this is a uh, orca eating a basking shark. Also, it's a still from another video that I found, um, but just thought that was a cool image of the orca with the shark. One of the really awesome things these days of aerial research is that you can just capture some amazing images. All right, so now we're gonna get into the range of orcas where I live, the residential community. So we talked a little bit about the offshore, and now we're gonna kind of tune in to this Salish Sea between Seattle and Vancouver region where the southern and northern residents live. So these southern residents in the Salish Sea are the J, K, and L pods, and they are very specific eaters. They only like to eat Chinook salmon. About 90% of their diet is Chinook salmon. And they are um, finding that these, these whales are actually starving right now because they only want to eat Chinook salmon. So they're swimming farther and farther out off the coasts because the rivers here, such as the Fraser River and the Columbia River, the salmon stock has gone down so much over the past 50, 40, 30 years, every decade, it's just less and less salmon coming back to spawn. And so these whales are spending more time off the coast of the Pacific to eat these or sorry, to find these fish. And Chinook salmon are historically gigantic fish, like they can weigh up to 100 pounds. Uh, these killer whales will take one fish and they'll share it amongst the family. And so that's the one they want. It's the fattiest, the most nutritious. And the picture on the right hand side, that's actually a salmon in that orca's mouth. Um, these three pods have been studied here. Uh, Ken Balcom is one of the leading researchers who started uh, research in the 70s here in the San Juan Islands. 
And they've just noticed and learned many different things about the orca dynamics. If you are really interested, you can check out the Center for Whale Research website. It's just full of amazing information. Um, but one of the things I found really cool living here is the superpod of these three families that would come back and they would come back to these waters here in the Salish Sea a week or two before the salmon would return to spawn. So usually the salmon are coming back depending on what river they're born in, in uh, you know, maybe July or August. And so these whales show up a little bit before the salmon come back and they would actually have what they called a greeting ceremony. And I was never lucky enough to see this, but I saw pictures of mine who are re from research so I've seen pictures from friends of mine who are researchers. And basically these family pods would line up like uh, football teams, two groups, and then they would slowly swim towards each other when they saw each other for the first time upon returning to these waters, and then swim with each other and roll around and greet each other and sing and rub and, uh, and then hang out and mate with each other and spend, uh, spend a couple of weeks hanging out and feeding on food together. And now, these days, uh, since I started working for Uncruise, I haven't been here solely in the Salish Sea, but since I left this area in about 2012, I stopped guiding out here and I started working with Uncruise, uh, there's been a major decline in the sightings of the southern residents here, and that's because the food's just not here. So you don't get the same kind of effect of these families coming back and uh, and, and, and hanging out and swimming together uh, as much, although it's not uh, impossible to find. But that's a really cool uh, piece of the culture of these animals and the southern residents, because they're so highly studied, are said to have their own culture from their language and their greeting ceremonies and the ways that they interact. So they are actually one of the few species, ecotypes of orcas that are on the endangered species list right now because their numbers are so low. And one of the reasons that their numbers are really low besides the lack of food is that when the, uh, the industry to bring orcas into captivity started, many of the orcas that were taken into captivity were actually taken from the Salish Sea Puget Sound area. And many of those, I think there's about 52 orcas that were taken and uh, there's only one that's still alive in captivity. But many of those were males. And if those males were alive today, they would be, uh, reproducing and then there might be a little bit more uh, number of animals out here even though the food source is so limited. But food is a pretty big problem for uh, these orcas out here and uh, some of the research that they've been doing, uh, there's lots of cool stuff but they have found what they call the grandmother theory and there's there's some great videos out there animated that talk about this grandmother theory and right now they've only they can only really document and say that's happening with the southern residents because those are the only whales that they've been studying and seeing it in but I mean I would assume that the northern residents that also eat fish might have a similar dynamic and this grandmother theory it has to do with uh, we'll come here that the female orcas actually go through a form of menopause and so the female orcas will they'll kind of reach puberty in their teens maybe about 15 to 17 years old and then uh, they'll start mating they'll uh, have a gestation of about 15 to 18 months and then they might nurse that calf for about another 14 months or so and then they they these days have a much larger calving inter interval than maybe in the past. But when they reach about 45 years old, they go through a menopause and they stop reproducing. But as I told you at the beginning of the presentation about Granny, who they say is somewhere between 100 and 104 when she died, uh, the grandmothers then become this role that helps take care of the rest of the animals. Uh, in this family structure. And they believe that through the studies that they've done that, you know, they've seen grandmothers can hold knowledge about where food is. And so they can help teach their daughters and their grandchildren where the food is and help uh, feed and share food. And uh, there are only four species out of the thousands and thousands of mammals that live on planet Earth, only four species that are thought to go through menopause besides human, and they're all odontocetes. And orcas are the only ones that are really well studied, but there's also a species of pilot whale that they've seen that go through the, the menopause, although the grandmother theory is unknown. 
And that's something I find totally fascinating about orcas is just so many of these similarities to family structure and, and to humans in general. I mean, just the fact that they can, their body physically changes and that they're able to play that role in caring for their young uh, is pretty amazing. This photo here is a great photo. A friend of mine just shared it with me recently. Uh, she used to work for the Center for Rural Research, and this is a mom and daughter, uh, J47 and J35, hanging out together. Uh, really sweet. All right, so I could talk about orcas for a really long time. I'm not even sure how long I've been talking here. Looks like a long time. Hope you're still with me out there. Uh, I'm just gonna mention a couple of things as I wrap it up. One is that orca that I mentioned that was taken from this area and is still in captivity. Her name is Lolita. And they've actually uh, played sounds of the recordings that they've taken of the orca dialects to her and she still uh, responds to the sounds that they play for her. There are movements to try to free Lolita. She's currently at SeaWorld in Florida and she's been living in captivity for over 35 years, which is pretty amazing. Uh, in general, orcas in the wild are gonna live much longer than orcas in captivity. Orcas in captivity usually live 25 to 30 years. In the wild, a female can live, you know, 60 to 85 years, and a male can live 40 to 55 years. Um, but she is an orca from this area where I live, and she's still uh, there in captivity. There's lots of different stories of orca in the news that I'd love to tell you about, but I, don't want you to fall asleep and I, you might have other things to do today. So I'm gonna keep it short and sweet and also tell you about uh, J35 uh, Telequa, who was in the news recently a year or two ago. I recently had a walk with a friend of mine who runs a program called Wild Orca that's working really hard to do conservation and research and bring education to try to save some of these southern resident whales down here who are, who are basically starving to death because there's just no food left for them. And this whale, I don't know if any of you heard about it, but it was in a lot of newspapers. Uh, J35, she had her baby and I think that, I don't know how long the baby lived exactly, maybe just uh, 24 hours or a little bit longer, but she carried this baby around and brought her all around the San Juan Islands, up by Victoria, over towards Vancouver, down towards Seattle. I think she, she swam for over a thousand miles carrying this baby for a few weeks, uh, almost as a way of communicating. My friend who is a researcher, we discussed just that, you know, these orcas are very sentient and to parade your deceased baby around like that is almost as if trying to tell these people who maybe you know are, are watching you that something is wrong. And um, these pictures are from the Center for Whale Research, so you can, uh, you can go on their website there and, and read more about it. But that's just another local orca that was in the news. Sorry, it's a little sad. Um, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and that is Eva, this really cute dog right here in this picture, who is becoming a TV sensation right now. Uh, there's been a few dogs that have been trained here in the San Juan Islands that can actually smell for whale poop and they can smell it about a quarter mile away. And then they kind of use the air and point which direction. And then they'll point the researchers boats over that way. And then the researchers can scoop up this whale poop and they can see what the whales have been eating. They can see if the whales are pregnant. They can actually test for stress hormones. They can see some of the impacts of marine pollution. So that's a really cool research project that's happening right now that's super non-invasive, where you don't have to go tag the whales or mess with them. Uh, they haven't found much success with those kind of research programs. So the best ones are done usually with uh, something like this, like this whale poop sniffing dog, or uh, there's also some really cool research happening right now with aerial drones where they're able to capture footage that of uh, social interactions and even just the health of whales up in BC in British Columbia. They were doing studies to see if those whales were getting enough salmon as well and they were able to take these aerial images and look at the width of the whale behind their dorsal fin and they were finding that those whales as well are also uh, not finding enough access to food. So they're able to do studies um, in these uh, non-invasive ways, which is really quite cool. So lots of great research happening right now, new papers coming out all the time. And as I was re-putting together some things for this presentation, like I was reading new things because I'm back here in this hub of orca research in the San Juan Islands. And uh, there's just a lot 
happening a lot to, to see and read. So I'd love if any of you guys have questions here at the end or want resources to check out, uh, I can point you in some of those directions. Uh, this is some of the references where I got a lot of my information. Some of the really beautiful photos that were on there was from a friend of mine that I work with in Antarctica. His name is Jens Wilkstrom and he just takes gorgeous pictures. So if any of you are huge Orca fans and just need a picture, you can check his stuff out. But in general, uh, NOAA, the Center for Royal Research, Cascadia Research, Wild Orca, really awesome uh, places to look for information. And um, even me as an Orca enthusiast, as I was refreshing up on some of the new research, there's just so much happening out there and people that are really involved. So uh, those are some great references to check out. And with that, that is my ORCA presentation. Thank you all so much for listening. And I would love to uh, see what kind of answers I can provide for some of your questions. And yeah, see who's on the call. Thank you so much. All right, can I open it up for any questions? I don't really know how this works now that I'm back on the chat. Okay, I see a question here. Why are they called killer whales? So because these transient orcas, uh, when first seen by humans, were eating marine mammals, that's where they, they decided they were killer whales. And there's actually different uh, Native American mythology uh, in different parts, some of the Coast Salish here, uh, that believe that the orcas were almost this non-animal because of the ways that they hunted and killed things. Uh, but that's the main reason they're called killer whales is because of the way that they uh, hunt in packs and eat other marine mammals. And I see one of what island was I speaking of? It's called, oh, this has already got it. San Juan Islands. San Juan Islands, we run some cruises here with Uncruise here in uh, the Salish Sea on the Safari Quest. It's a pretty awesome itinerary and lots of uh, opportunities for exposure to orcas and lots of beautiful things. Maybe I can wave to you if you're on the quest this summer. But I don't know, Liz, if we can unmute people if anyone has any questions they want to ask. Sure. Uh, there was one other question. Uh, it says, can we eat well meat? And in the meantime, I'll see if we can go ahead and unmute everybody. Sure. So I would never think that eating whale meat is a great idea because of the bioaccumulation of toxins that whales have, even for mysticetes. Um, I know that in some different countries in Asia, like Japan, there might be whale meat that's sold and there's a lot of controversy around if that's good to eat. And uh, out here, there has been no um, history of humans killing killer whales or killer whales attacking humans. Uh, the only Native Americans, First Nation people in this area that have any whales that they eat are the macaw on the coast and the whale that they eat. Sorry about the dings. Hi, this is Bob Schloss and my question is, do we know how many orcas there are in the world? Is there something like a census of orcas by scientists? Yeah, so there, the general estimate ar across the planet is about 50,000 orcas. And a majority being down in the, the southern hemisphere. But we're still learning stuff all the time, and uh, it's kind of hard to get exact censuses on some of these questions. It doesn't look like there's any right now, but everybody does have the uh, opportunity to uh, speak if they want and just speak directly to Sarah. A lot of thank yous, great presentation, wonderful, great to see you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. I was a little nervous for my Zoom, first Zoom presentation, but I feel like it went pretty good. Usually I like to interact with all of you in person. So thanks for showing up here, and I hope to maybe sail with some of you in the future.